Okay, everyone. I am so uber, uber excited to introduce you to uh, not only my girl crush, but my girlfriend who I refuse. I will never say her full name or her first name. I'm sorry, her first name because she's a judge, a real judge who sits on the bench. And as a lawyer, it is pro, it is a, a sacrilegious for me to ever say her first name by itself. So please meet my girl crush forever, Judge Glenda Hatchett. I am so happy to be here. Oh. I am. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this. But not only am I those things to you, I am also now family. Oh, well, I yes. am now family. You sure and are. I count it as a blessing. I like likewise. I count you and Mike and the children, your extended family. You're all blessings in my life, oh, and I, I I mean that. And I I'm thankful for the gift. I oh, thank and you. So anytime I get a chance to spend time with you. It's a gift. Thank you. And I know, and you saying that is one thing, but the way you treat us and your actions is a whole other thing because you do, you follow through. You do make us feel important. You do make us feel loved and in your family. You so are. when we went to Atlanta, by yes. the way, the judge is from Atlanta. Yes, I oh, am. We got a very quick glimpse of it yes. and we're going to go back and you are. do the grand tour with you. We are. And we're going to have some really wonderful family time. Oh. You know, we come in my house and take off your shoes yes. and just eat. And just be, you yeah. know, and just, and I'm going to take you to all the wonderful places in Atlanta. You're going to go see Dr. King's oh, grave yeah. and the monuments. I'm going to take you to the Civil Rights Museum. Oh, it's such a I'm going to take you to city. the um, home where Margaret Mitchell, who wrote Gone with the Wind, lived. Amazing. And there are just so many things. The AU Center is the largest conglomerate of historically black colleges and universities in the world oh, is there is so and intriguing. we will go we will walk those campuses we're just gonna have a wonderful time i can't wait i can't, I wait. can't wait either so okay judge i like to start this podcast off okay. with asking my interviewee okay three words to describe yourself um grounded grateful um blessed mm. Okay, so a lot of you do know the judge from TV, but what you don't know is the story behind the judge and yes. how you actually became a judge. So there's a TV personality, yes. which you all see, and that's the fun, cool, like, <laughs> you know, Hollywood part of it. Mm -hmm. But there is this profound life that you are building, and I'm so excited to showcase and share with people today. Yes. So. First and foremost, and I'm going to ask you about the Delta Airlines story. Sorry, okay. because that is one that sticks yes, with me. Yes, yes. I'm happy to share. Are you doing what you envisioned you would do when you were a little girl looking forward at your life? Absolutely not. Absolutely where, not. Where did that little girl think you were going to be? I thought that I was going to be a pediatrician. Okay. Um, and the reason being is because my mother always wanted to be a pediatrician. My mother was one of nine children. My grandparents were wonderful, but didn't have the resources. Mm -hmm. And my mother was born at a time when little colored girls didn't have opportunities. She was very smart. She graduated top of her class, but she went home to be a school teacher because that was her world. Mm -hmm. That's what she could do at the time. And I've said so many times, Gina, that if my mother had a fraction of the opportunities I'd had, she would have been Surgeon General. Mm. She was absolutely amazing. But she was never bitter about that because she poured her life into teaching um, and has made a remarkable difference in a number of her students' lives. And maybe another time we can talk about her in more detail, but I thought that would be so cool. Plus I was, you know, I love science and I love math. So I thought wow. that was what I was gonna be. Except I had two younger brothers. And honey, that blood thing was just, you know, they would get, <laughs> they would get hurt. Sure. And I was like, you know, I don't know that this, <laughs> you know, I don't think this mm -mm. is really my thing. So by the time I got to high school, I was absolutely set on becoming an aeronautical engineer. Really? I was fascinated with the space program. Uh, when I was a little girl, it was called Cape Canaveral, and it was changed to Cape Kennedy. 
And I would watch all the launches and I would just be glued when they would be splashed down. I mean, I just thought that what, was it. What about, like, how did you learn about that? Watching the TV? Yeah, watching the TV. And then I had great teachers in high school. Mm -hmm. I had great teachers, really great teachers in high school. Where'd you grow up? So I grew up in Atlanta. I went to public schools in Atlanta, Georgia. And and I just was very fortunate to have teachers who believed in me and so that I could be anything. But backing up even back before that, mm -hmm. my daddy always told me I could be anything in the world. Oh, my daddy gosh. was my hero. Um, he died suddenly almost 30 years ago. He was, was then and will be throughout eternity. I mean, mm -hmm. my father made me believe that being a little colored girl was not a curse. And so I believed him. I believed I could do anything in the world. So uh, I had a boyfriend in high school. Um, <laughs> eye roll. Eye roll, super eye roll, uh, <sighs> who said to me, uh, because he had left our public high school and had gone to prep school mm. in, um, in, in the Northeast. And he said, Glenda, it's really too bad that we're not gonna be able to be together in college because I'm going to MIT mm. and you won't be able to get in. No, oh. Oh, wait. Oh. oh. Huh. So I said, I'll get in before you get in. Right? Now, you know, I wasn't planning on applying to MIT, but then it became, you know, it became an ego. Yeah, thing, right? challenge accepted. Yeah. And so I did, and I got in. <gasps> I did. I, I didn't know that. I did. I got into MIT. Oh, my God. And you're I was so going to go. No, no. Oh, but, you really are, no. though. I was going to go, official. and I was like, okay, I'm going to be an aeronautical engineer. I'm going to be an aeronautical engineer. I'm going to MIT. And so then I came to my senses, and I ended up going to a liberal arts college, which I'm really glad I did, because I was only going to go to MIT because of the, you know, it was my ego. It was like, you know, yeah. how dare you say that to me? Just because I'm a girl, you think I, I, you know, what? And so, but, you know, I love, you know, showing it and rubbing into his face yeah. that I got in. Well, he got in too, but, but you know, the fact that That's I got point, in, yeah. point made. Yeah. Um, so... Anyway, I, I know, I, if you had told me I would be a judge, I would have been, mm-mm. When I was growing up, that was never on my radar. I never intended uh, to be, you know, like there's some kids who know, you know, oh, when yeah. they're little kids that they want to be a lawyer. Mm -mm. In fact, uh, my, I remember I must have been about seven or eight, and I was out shopping with my dad one day, one Saturday, and we met um, Romay Turner Powell, who was this amazing black woman lawyer in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and she was a civil rights lawyer. And she was on the case, and this is important, Hearts of Atlanta was a motel in downtown Atlanta that refused to integrate their facility. Mm -hmm. And they said it was privately owned and that they didn't have to comply. She was one of the lawyers on that case oh that went all the way to the US Supreme Court that said that it because it is interstate travel and people are traveling yeah. across state lines that they were bound by the federal, federal law right so anyway so i but this is you know she i was i was little i you know and my dad said you know going to maybe one day you'll grow up to be a lawyer just like uh attorney uh, powell and i'm thinking to myself mm, no you know because in my mind i was going to be a pediatrician so years later, and we can get back to that part, years later, I succeeded her on the bench. No. I did, Gina, I did. I did, I did. Mm. Yeah, and she was the first wow. black woman, no, excuse me, she was the first black um, state judge of any court in Georgia. Stop it. Right, so she was this amazing civil rights lawyer and then she was appointed to the bench. Did you get close to her? I did, I did, I did. In fact, she called me from her hospital bed. Mm. So I know we're talking out of sequence, but, but while we're talking okay. about her, she called me from her hospital bed one Saturday morning, and usually I was out with kids on Saturday morning, you know, baseball, soccer, something, right? And it was just happened that my then husband was out with the kids, and I was home, and the house was quiet. That has not ever, ever happened on a Saturday morning. With I mean, kids. we're working moms. You know how that is, right? And the phone rang, and it was Judge Powell, right? And she talked to me, 
And this is a woman who would call and she would say, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da, and you might get two minutes out of her and then she was gone. Yeah. We talked for almost two hours. Mm. I did not know that she was terminally ill mm. and that she was in, I mean, she, I didn't know. And she was coughing and I said, oh, you're okay. And she said, yes, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And she said, Glenda, would you ever leave your job? And I said, no, ma'am, I am so happy. I have my whole career path. And at this point, you're a lawyer at Delta, at Delta Airlines. Airline, which we will talk about. <laughs> yes, right, I know, we're jumping around. Mm. It's okay. But she, um, she said, you know, and then her husband told me after she died, he said, Glenda, she called you oh. because you were her choice to come to the bench after Stop she died. It. Her family gave me, I'm going to tear up. Me too. Her family gave me, because she was my son, she was teeny. Her family gave me her robe. Oh, when my I God. was being sworn in, her husband and her two children, her two adult children came, sat with my family on the front row, and they gave me, presented me her robe that I still have after all these years. The black robe that the judges wear. Yes. Mm. Yes. So it's interesting how your life. You never know. You never know. Wow. You never know. You never know. And I always looked up to her, and even when I was in law school, you know, I'd see her, she'd encourage me. And one night after Charles was born, mm -hmm. who you know, he was a new baby, and I was at an um, Urban League dinner or NAACP dinner, and she looked at me, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm calling, going out to call to just check on the baby. She said, go back in, get your purse, and go home. Mm. She said, well, there'll be hundreds of dinners. So smart. There'll be hundreds of dinners. Go home. That's right. You're not going to get the time with the kids back, but there'll always be the work. And I've always remembered that. She just simply said, go. In fact, I tell you what she did. She sent somebody to the table. She said, what's your table number? She said, I'm sending somebody back in there because you'll start making excuses. She sent somebody in there. <laughs> and then she watched me get up the escalator. Wow. Just go home. Gosh. What, what a, a gift. I was just going <laughs> to say, what a gift to have that spirit in your life through your journey yes. wow so thank blessed. you for sharing that that's so beautiful i didn't know that story yes, yes. okay so tell me how you became a lawyer oh <laughs> how did we pivot from astronaut aeronautical engineer <laughs> mit to lawyer yes so i ended up going to mount holyoke okay. one of the seven sister colleges i had gotten into at that time, um, Radcliffe was the women's college part of Harvard. So I'd gotten into Harvard Radcliffe, and, and, but I, I had applied to four of the seven sisters, hoping I'd get into one. And thankfully, I got into all four. And I was trying to make up my mind between going to the Radcliffe Harvard or going to Mount Holyoke. Mount Holyoke was just a few miles from where my dad's only two brothers lived. Mm -hmm. So there was family nearby. And the women that I had met, and two particular, one particular who lived in Atlanta who recruited me to Mount Holyoke is one of my dearest friends to this day. And so I ended up going to Mount Holyoke and um, majoring in history and political science, but wasn't ready to go to law school, mm. right? I just was like, I, I couldn't quite get my yeah. commitment. So I worked for a year. And then I went back to law school after a year, and then I was ready to be in law school. I, you know, because you really, as you know, you have to really be in the frame. Oh, that's it. You know, I mean, you've got it. It's got to be serious. But fool here was working full time. Oh, and going to law school oh. full time. It was crazy, Gina. I was. I look back on that, and I think, my God, how did I do that? working full-time going to law school full-time wow and it wasn't a job that i could kind of you know slide i was the assistant dean for women in the undergraduate oh, school. oh so it was like a legitimate job not you know and so i had responsibility for the women's complex i had 300 students so i might have been up all night in the er with one of my <sighs> students who had been raped <sighs> I may have had to tell a student that her father was killed in a car accident. Oh my gosh. And I'd have this, you know, the one who'll come down and say, oh, I need to talk to you, it's an emergency, only to find out that her boyfriend left her for her sorority sister. And I'm thinking, girl, please. <laughs> I'm 
I'm sitting here trying to understand <laughs> contracts and torts <laughs> and criminal procedure. And Get t- out. You know, you know, then I have to go into of my- Of course, you have to. It's your job. Thing. Now, sweetie, oh. I sit down and think about this. Oh. You're better off without him because if he would do that to you, Come yeah, on. come on, ladies. Come on. And if she, she's not your, you know, I have to go through all that, but I'd be thinking, okay, oh. I've got real life issues to deal with. But anyway, so I worked my way through law school. Um, my parents were wealthy. My family was wealthy in things that money can't measure. Mm. It's very important that I share that, that money can't measure. My parents didn't have money, but what they had, you couldn't put a value on it and so I had two younger brothers and I thought okay I need to take on this responsibility you know I'd gotten some scholarships and so forth but I worked I worked through law school um and I was crazy I also got very sick my first semester and I've never really talked about this publicly but we're going to be all transparent today that's what we do that's what we do because this story will help somebody I, I know it so I was studying for those first set of exams, which, you know, it's so intimidating and so horrific in law school, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't, because you've never taken exams like that before. And so I'm sitting there and I'm studying with a guy who had, who was much older, who had been a paramedic in P- Vietnam, mm-hmm. been in the army and had gone and then came back to law school. And he said, Glenda, what's that in your neck? And I said, leave me alone. There's, and there was this huge knot. No. In my neck. Right. And I, you know, and I did feel it, and I'm like, oh. Had you noticed it before? I had not noticed it. I'm working full time and studying. You know, I mean, I I wasn't paying any attention to myself or my health. I wasn't. Of course. And he said, I'm getting ready to take you. And so Emory University has, you know, it's a law school, also has a medical school, and one of the best best. hospital systems anywhere in the Southeast. So I was in a good situation, and he says, I'm going to take you. And I'm like, no, I've got to study for this exam. He said, Glenda, I am taking you. So I stood up and said, leave me alone. And when I stood up, I fainted. Right? And so he takes me. I get admitted to the hospital. And they diagnose me with Hodgkin's disease. No! Right? And I'm like, okay, God. All right. So I check myself out of the hospital. I go take my exams. Well, uh- Right? And then I'm like, okay, I've got to go home and tell my parents. Oh my gosh. Right? I then decided to go to my doctor, my family doctor, who I loved, mm. to talk to him first because I really wanted to help him, get him to help me to talk to my parents. Right. He ran a bunch of tests. It was a false positive. What does that mean? I didn't have Hodgkin's oh. disease. There is a three day window that, that, mimics Hodgkin's disease I had well I was sick I had infectious mononucleosis which is still no picnic but I wasn't gonna die okay you're just gonna be a little tired I'm gonna be very tired (laughs) and very sick but I'm gonna live so I'm like thank you God right so you didn't tell your parents Mm -mm. well that diagnosis I didn't tell them holy moly yeah and And it really hit you though the sickness I was really sick I was really sick and so the question, my doctor said, Linda, I really think you need to take the semester off mm. because your system is so, you're so, you know, you're so weak. And it's just not like having mono. I had infectious mononucleosis, yeah. which is a whole different, uh, totally. whole different thing. So fast forward, I went to this um, visiting professor who was a black woman. I mean, you know, we didn't have black faculty back then at Emory, and we just didn't. And I went and I told her my situation, and she told me to leave her office. She said, I made it the hard way. Nobody helped me. Do not ask me for help. She said, I got here on my own, and you figure it out. Gina, and that's why you look at me sometimes when I'm doing stuff for other people. That is the genesis of that. Mm. There is, and you see me. There's nothing I won't do. If I can help somebody, you know that I will stop what I'm doing, and I will say, what can I do to help you? And just... To add to this particular moment, something you have taught me that you said, I don't even know if you realize you said it one time I did thank you because the judge is consistently, if she can help you even with an email, a phone call, a connection, anything, she does it. I thanked you and you said, do not thank me. It is my responsibility to do this. 
And I've adopted saying that because it was so profound. It is. I'd never thought, we. I felt it, but I'd never articulated it that way. Right. And it, you said that, and it was the first time you focused that for me. Right. And now I say it. And so it was from this. So it was from that experience that I left that office, Gina, oh. that day. And I was like, I am not going to let her see me cry. No. I am not going to let her see me cry. Mm -mm. I'm not. And I walked out in the hall and I was like, Linda, hold it together, get on the elevator and get out of the building, but do not let mm -mm. her see you cry. And I promised myself from that day to this, that if there was ever anything, and I'm not saying I have all the answers, I'm not saying you have most of them. No, I'm not saying you know I can, but but if I do I have know, it, yeah. and if I can, I will stop what I'm doing. I've seen it, and I will. And my dad always said you have to lift as you climb. That's exactly you right. Gotta lift as you climb, but that day is etched in my soul. And I thought, what a mean, horrible thing to have said, particularly because I was sick. And I was saying, do I do I leave this semester? Because if I left that semester, because you were the just way that, asking for advice, right? not for help, right? And I because I'd have to wait the whole year. I'd mm -hmm. have to wait back to the next January. I couldn't have started in the fall. I'd have to wait and pick back up the next that second semester in the fall. So I'd be out of school for a whole year. I didn't. I didn't leave school. And I, 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 you know, I worked through it. Mm -hmm. But I was just saying, I, you know, I need some advice. Wow. And she said, no, get she out. She told me to get up and get out of her house. But thinking of it from a gratitude angle, thank God she did that because what the silver lining is, is yeah. it created this yeah. fire yeah. in you and the numerous people you've helped in one way or I another so. because of that. Oh, I know it. I see it. I know. Yeah. And people can attest to it yeah. because of that. Thankfully to that woman, yeah. that poor, bitter woman, you yeah. know, yeah, I feel bad for her to be that angry and bitter. Yeah. It created who you are. Yeah, it helped to create. I think I would have had that spirit, mm -hmm. but it was a defining moment in my life, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I think I would have had, because I've always had that kind of giving spirit, but it, it, it solidified it for me. Like, okay, you know, if someone comes, and I'm hoping also that I can anticipate that the people don't always have to ask me. I hope that there are times when I have seen it and said, what can I do? Mm -hmm. um, because I came along when I was the first of so many oh, times. Gosh, I know. You know, I mean, there had never been a black woman at Delta Airlines as an attorney. There had never been a black person, man or woman, to have clerked in the Northern District Federal Court in Georgia. Never. There had never been a black person, man or woman, to ever be the chief judge of a state court in Georgia. And so there was always this target you know, on my chest, that people were just like, you know. Which is a perfect segue into yeah. the whole empowerment conversation, yeah. which transcends time and yes, space. Yes, yes, you know, I'm it, talking too much. No, I'm no, you're not. This detail. is, you must talk a lot, please. Mm -hmm. The empowerment, okay, a lot of us feel, it's all relative, our struggles, our, our obstacles, our challenges, this, yeah. that, the other, but yeah. on top of our personal inner struggles, you, dealt were dealt literally the reality of not being accepted not being wanted right being the first of something which right. has its own whole other onion of layers oh of my God. trying to even position yourself to be considered to even push it yeah. position yourself to kick down the door and get in and then right. once you're there tolerating people who don't agree with you who don't necessarily right. like you for whatever reason yeah. for, and racism and sexism let's call it what it is that's it racism and sexism yes. which Alive and well today. Yes, absolutely. But not may, mostly not as focused as you dealt with it. Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, it's not. But it, it is still, obviously, we know, very yeah. alive. Yeah. What do you advise to someone in their own struggle right now who mm -hmm. might not be facing overt, yeah. overt right. sexism and racism? Right. It's there. Or their own struggle. Yeah. What was your mantra? What got you through? Yeah. Um, it was that I believed in myself. I do. I, you know, I just believed in myself and I had to make a decision that I was either going to be a victim or I was going to be victorious. There's a chapter in my second book where I talk about that. 
What's the name of the book? His name, the name of the book is Dare to Take Charge. Dare to Take Charge. How to Live Your Life on Purpose. Look it up. Buy it right now. How Dare to Take Charge. And there's a, there's a chapter in that book where I talk, and literally the chapter is victim or victorious. Oh. And Gina, I have had to live by that. That it is very easy to say, oh my God, I'm a black woman. Mm. And I am catching hell because of I baby C. Because I'm black. I'm black. And I'm a woman. I'm a woman. I'm black. Or I'm catching hell because I'm a woman. Or I'm catching hell because of both. Right? The truth is that I have caught hell because of both. And I continue to catch hell because of both. Mm-hmm. But I'll be damned if I'm going to be a, ever a victim. I'm never going to be a victim. And so when I talk to young people, for instance, here I had this thing years ago, I was talking to a group of young black women attorneys. And they were saying, well, judge, it's not fair. And I said, I never told you it's been fair. I'm telling you what's real. When I went into the federal courthouse and they had never had a black clerk there before, there were clerks who would go to lunch I would never be invited. Mm. But one of my dearest, wonderful friends to this day was a clerk for another judge. And we became like this, right? And he covered my back. He was there. He was wonderful. And it turned out that there were two positions at Delta Airlines. There were hundreds of people who applied. We both got hired. And so we were at Delta together. And that's a whole nother story. But he was just, oh, I mean, he was just this wonderful man who then he left Delta to become an Episcopal priest. And I (laughs) cried. I cried. Um, But he's, you know, Stacy Sauls, and, you know, if he's watching this or hears about this, I love him to this day because he bucked the others. Oh. And he would say, Linda, would you like to have lunch? I love him. Or he would come and stick his head in. You know, what are you working on? Is there something I can help you? And that he'd be my sounding board. But I was used to being by myself. I was used to being out there. I was used yeah. to being the, I mean, it sounds corny, this trailblazer, um, but it's true. And when you are a trailblazer, you're gonna get your ass kicked. And you're alone. And there's no other way to say it. You can't dress it up. Mm-mm. You can't sugarcoat it. Mm-mm. That is the reality. Mm-hmm. And so I had to decide and a lot of this goes back to my father, that I could do anything I set out to do. I could do anything, right? And it was hard, and it was horrible. There were days when I would just be like, "Oh my God!" But it, you know, but that's been the that's been the that's been the piece. So, in terms of your question about empowerment. I do a lot of speeches around the country and I do workshops, particularly for women. And one of the things I challenge us to do as women is that you can't be powerful until you're clear about who you are. That's right. You can't, you can't. You cannot be powerful. You cannot be empowered until you're clear about who you are and to whom you belong. Mm. My faith is rooted in my faith of God. That may not be your reality. And, and, and so I don't impose what I believe, right? That is what I do. I, you know, there have been times when I've like, I mean, and you know some of my personal really tragedies and struggles, but that is what has kept me grounded, um, but also believing in myself. So I will ask people questions. What is your purpose? What if people are say, I don't know. Then I say, then I want you to get quiet. I want you to do some soul searching. I want you to search your heart. This is not for anybody else. This is not for public consumption. This is for you. And I do these workshops where I'll take them through these steps of really sitting down and thinking about what it is. The purpose, but it has to be the intersection of your purpose and your passion. Mm. Because it's not enough to be purposeful if you don't have that passion. I mean, I look at what you do and I look at how excited you get about 
the things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me joyful because yeah. I know that you are at a place in your life where your purpose and your passion have intersected and it's your passion that fuels this purpose, yeah. right? And so I had these conversations. Um, you know, I've never done an all men's workshop, but I've done. That's a good one, you should. Yeah, I They're should. the ones who need it. Right, I've never done that. And you all need to invite me to do that. So, yeah, but what I say is that it has to be authentic. I'll ask them, I have golden, Glenda's golden rules. And so, oh, you know, a few they? of them are, for instance, I'll say, you must be authentic. You can't live somebody else's dream or purpose. You can't. Mm -mm. It has to be this. It has to be authentic. And so you can't be powerful. You just can't. Mm -mm. You can act like you're powerful. You can front all day. Buy all the fancy, fancy things. Fancy stuff. You can try to all trick everyone. Litter. You can drive the fancy cars. Please. You can take the bags. All Please. of that. It does Means not matter. Nothing. Unless you are authentically grounded in who you are and your purpose in your life that is fueled by passion. And I believe that with my soul. And so that is what keeps me grounded, my faith my belief in myself, uh, I have to try, I work harder. Quick story, if we have time. Yeah, have of course, time? yeah, we have time. Okay, quick story. Yeah, good. Quick story, um, I was at Delta Airlines. That's what I wanted to ask next because okay. I was going to segue, actually, I no, hope no. this is what we're going to talk about yeah. because talking about adversity, adversity <laughs> and challenges and being told no and people underestimating you and you're a woman, a woman of color, all the things we are told that we should define ourselves as to keep ourselves powerless. Yes. You did not abide by. And one of the stories you've told me, which is just, I love this story so much. <laughs> Can you please share? You know which one I'm asking about. Yes. Yes. Favorite. Yes. So I am. Um, this is what I mean about you have to be clear about who you are and be clear about your capabilities and be secure in that. I don't care what anybody else says. You have got to know who you are. So I'm in, this is the story. I am in New York City in high rise and this huge, you know, law firm, and this big conference room. And I am the lead attorney on a major antitrust case representing Delta Airlines. Not only am I black, not only am I a woman, but I'm barely, I'm like, maybe 30. Oh my gosh. 30, 30, 31. Ay, ay, ay. So I'm, I'm young, right? I'm really young. And so, and you might imagine I look a lot younger than I really was. And still do. Well, thank you. Hello. Thank you. And she is as beautiful in person as she looks on TV. I'm just telling you. Thank you. You're welcome. And so I'm sitting there, you know, and I am fully prepared. So this is a class action antitrust suit and you as a lawyer know that if I lost this case mm. the the trap there will be trouble damages so for those the, the, the if the damages were a hundred million dollars they would automatically get 300 million dollars right. right so a lot on the line mm. and he comes in who's he the uh, yes the opposing attorney who's representing the class okay that's suing Delta Airlines comes in and he looks at me and he says, we'll get started when your boss gets here. So in that second, oh. Gina, I had to either cuss him out, because I am capable of going there now. I know, you know I've all, seen it. All those degrees. And I love it. And all those titles, all that. I can go there. <laughs> I can go there. I, do, I don't go there often, but I can go there. And you know I can go there. I know, it's so good. So he comes in, and I, you know, the first instinct is, I'm just gonna curse him out. Yeah. And I didn't. Of course not. I took I took a deep breath and I said, I am the lead counsel oh, on this case. <laughs> <laughs> and I will admit, I wouldn't do it now. My sisters, I would not do it now. All my feminist friends do not write me or call me or text me. <laughs> but back in the day, you might have to think about how long ago this was. Back in the day. I would sign all of my pleadings, G, Hatchet, and then I was married at the time, Johnson. So it was G, Hatchet, Johnson, 
they didn't they didn't understand I was a woman. Right. You right. hid behind the I did. G. I did. Hey, I don't fault I mean, you, and you don't owe anyone an explanation. First of all, right, and, and that's you what had I, to do I had to what do, you had, had to do to, do to survive. survive. I had to do that to survive. Right? I applaud it. Yeah, I had to do Smart. it to survive. So, so everything was G. Hatchet Johnson. It never occurred to him that I was a woman. It never occurred to him that I was a woman. Why would he? Why would he think that? And, and he, it surely didn't occur to him that I was a black, black woman, woman, right? And that I was, you know, maybe 30, oh. 31, right? I mean, and he comes in. And so this is what he does, Gina. And you know this story. I love it. He, when I said I am the lead counsel on this, oh. he laughed in my face. He sat down and I said, and we'll get started when I'm ready. Very calmly. I, that's what I said to him. Then he opens his briefcase, takes out a magazine, starts turning the pages, completely ignores mm. me, right? And so I start off with softball questions and he gets very comfortable and gets like, oh, you know, she's just a pushover. She doesn't know what she's doing right. And then I go in for that, ah! right? Get him. So then, so I don't know what happened that his, his um, client answered a question. I don't remember what the question or the answer was, but something triggered him to start sitting up and paying attention. Mm -mm. And then he realized he was in trouble. Too right? late. Because this guy had made all these admissions that were very helpful to my clients. So <laughs> he, he, he kind of sits up and he says, I want to I wanna stop the deposition. I said, we're not stopping. He says, I, I, I want to I I I postpone this. I said, no, I noticed this deposition. When there's no reason to stop it. And he says, well, I, I, I said, we'll call the judge. He says, well, then I want to take a break. And I was like, by all means, you know, like, because <laughs> I knew he hadn't been paying attention and I knew I had his client so by the hairs. Good. So then he goes out and he tries to coach him and it just gets, you know. Oh, it's just a mess at that point. Gina? Wow. I won that case. Of course you did. But wait for it. I won that case on preliminary motions. That is unheard Her. of in an antitrust case unheard of so i had a counterclaim so my my uh my general counsel you know is congratulating me and you know and there were some who didn't think i could of course not so my general counsel who i you know just had such respect for uh, i mean he was just really a solid guy and so he then says glenda i need you to drop the counterclaim i'm saying oh no jim i got this he says no you've won I need you to drop the counterclaim. Mm. I'm thinking, okay, yes, sir. So later, I get a call that the attorney wants to apologize to me. Oh, what did you think when you got that? I said, no, thank you. Why? Because I didn't need his apology. I did not need his validation. I know who I am. And I didn't need his apology. But see, that's what prejudice is. Mm. He had prejudged me. Yes. He assumed because I was black, I was a woman, and I was young, yeah. that I couldn't possibly have been able to navigate a multi, multi, multi million dollar lawsuit against a global airline. He couldn't even in his wildest dreams. And so, no, thank you. I didn't need his apology. Oh my gosh. I, I had what I wanted. I won. And so what I tell young lawyers is that I'm not saying you should take stuff off of people. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. But you need to be strategic in the battles that you fight. That's right. And I could have cursed him out. I could have. Perfectly capable of doing that. But it was more important for me to take my energy to figure out how I tacked his ass to the wall yes. to win. And that's what I did. And I said, there'll be times in your life You've got to figure out, instead of getting mad, you've got to figure out how you win. Right. I worked harder in every situation I've been in. Mm. I've always had to work harder, Gina. People say, but that's not fair. Fair, it's not about it's fairness. Not, it's not about fairness. It's about the reality that people expected less of me or assumed that I was there because I was in an affirmative action quota piece. And that didn't bother you? So people are like, oh, they just need the token. Because I get that sometimes too. 
you're you know, just the token. Well, How I do had, you respond? I had to get over that very early in my life because it was far more pervasive because I'm so much older than you are. But think about what it was like for me oh. because there were so few black women doing anything, right? Right. And so they would say, well, you got into this school, you got into this, you got into this, you did this, you got this job because you're black, you took a position that a white person should have. And I had to just tune that out mm -hmm. because once I got in that door, I knew that I could show them that I was excellent. I never lost a case at Delta Airlines. What? Never. There was nobody in the department, mm. almost 10 years. 10 years. Almost 10 years. There was nobody in the department. Well, eight years, because the last two years I, I had another assignment. I was mm -hmm. moved over to do crisis management for the company. Eight years, actually, as a lawyer, I never lost a case. Nobody in the department could say that. Nobody else in the department could say that but me. And they would say, well, you know, it's because you settled all your cases. I never settled a case. Because if it got to my desk, the people in the company knew. I said, now listen, if it gets to my desk, and then I would got the reputation of that B won't settle, I would spend $100,000 defending a case before I write you a check for $10,000. Right? If, if we were right. Of course. If we were right. Sure. But I said, now, if it gets to my desk, you know, you all better be sure that, you know, you're ready. There's not some problems here because I am not going to settle these cases. So I got the reputation got of being the hard ass. Yeah. And it served me well because the people were like, mm, no, don't, don't, mm -mm. don't, yeah. don't mess with her. I don't settle So you case. proved it. I proved it. And I never lost the case because I worked really hard. I never took anything for granted. I knew that people were watching me. I knew there were people who were waiting for me to trip up. Mm -hmm. There were people hoping that I would fail. Mm. There were people who sabotaged me. You bet. And I was more determined than ever that I was going to prevail. Mm. And you're doing all of this while being married and having children. Right. Oh. I was a, I was a, Whoa. I was a assistant bar examiner in Georgia. God, I was so crazy. And I was literally grading bar exams when I went into labor with Christopher. No. <laughs> well, I believe it. No, I was, you. I was crazy. It was crazy. I was like, you know, but I'm like, okay, we gotta have some white people in this. We gotta, you know. Of course, I am sitting I there grading bar exams, and I went into labor. So your whole life has never been it's either or. You are just I'm doing it. This is what's happening, right. and I'm gonna balance it how I have to. Yeah. What do you tell people about balancing, especially the women, <sighs> the one working moms? Yeah. It is. It's you know. It's, I would it's do common. it differently. If really? I did it over again, yes. I made a lot of mistakes, and I'm very transparent about those mistakes. Okay. Because it cost me. Like, it really cost me. It cost health-wise. Okay. You know, I would work. I thought that I was Superwoman. Mm. I want to tell everybody there's no such thing. No. She is a fictional character, and I paid a very heavy price. Because not only was I a working mother with a very, very, very demanding job, when I was nursing Charles, literally, I would, my first case was in Houston, Texas. I would literally nurse him, pump, get on a flight oh. because I could gain an hour going. The company was so accommodating. I could take the uh, helicopter from the airport. I could land on the building what? and the helicopter. I would work all day. I would get back on the helicopter, fly back to the, to Hobby. I would do it at a Hobby airport in Houston. And then I would come home oh. and I'd do the same thing the next day. I would do that. For my first case, I was flying back. I was commuting every day for almost a month. With a newborn. With a, right? Well, he was, I went to work when he was six months old, but, but still a new baby, right? And, um, and so what happened is that I didn't have balance in my life. Okay. I did not. And I'm very transparent about that because I don't want others to do what I did. I don't. I paid a very heavy cost, health-wise, um, physically, mentally, because I didn't think the world could function without mm. me being mm. on top of everything. I was at work one day. I was sick as a dog. A guy came into the meeting in the conference room. I was at Delta. He said, you know, Glenda, how many planes do you think didn't fly the day that Woolman, Woolman was the one who found the Delta, said, you know how many planes didn't fly the day that he died? He said, not one. He said, so pack your stuff. Really? 
and go home. He said, you're sick. You're running a fever. I said, but I've got it. Uh, he said, go home. Just go home, right? And so I didn't take care of myself. You know, um, when I was on the bench, mm. I would go, 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 go. I wouldn't have lunch. I'd stop, have crackers, and then wash it down with a Coke. Oh. I got pneumonia when, oh. I was, when I was in New York taping my first show. I was so sick. Charles had to fly to New York to get me. I was that sick. Took me home. My father had died by then. To my old room at my mother's house. Oh, I was so sick. Gosh. I couldn't be left alone. I was so sick with pneumonia. And I looked at the ceiling, Gina. I'm telling you all these stories today. I looked at the ceiling and I said, God, please. I know I've said this before, but I promise, God, if you let me get me up off this bed, I promise you I'm going to do better. I know I promised before, but God, I really mean it this time. I said, because if I die, my ex-husband will get custody of the children. <laughs> That's not motivation. I'm motivation, right? So um, I, I'm not still where I should be, but my birthday was in May last year, and I made some radical, radical changes. I told you, I made yeah. some radical I am putting myself first. I'm happier than I've been in 45 years, yes. and I'm doing stuff for me. And yeah. what I say to working mothers, particularly who are balancing mm. marriages and children and work demanding careers is that, if you aren't okay, your kids are not going to be okay. Mm. Your husband's not going to be okay. Your marriage is not going to be okay. And everybody was okay, but I wasn't healthy. I wasn't. I look back on it now, and so I'm very transparent about it. Love that. And so you've got to, you've got to have some balance. You've got to have some fun. One of the things I did do when I became a judge is that people would ask me about my cases and you know, you know, horrible things I'd see. Yeah. And I remember at Christmas. Party. I was sworn in October 1st at Christmas. I was going to parties and it's coming home feeling like, oh, just so dark. Mm. And I realized it's because I was talking about my work. Mm. So I had to say to everybody, I can't talk to you about it. I can't talk to you about that child that was beaten to death. I can't talk to you about that gang member who executed mm. all these people. I can't talk to you about this. And so I put my key in the door and I would have to say, on the other side of this door, I'm a mother, mm. I'm a wife, mm -hmm. I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend. And I had to really discipline myself that I, and when I was at work, I worked like hell, but I had to like, you know, and that's one of the things I, I did do well. You learned to say no. I learned to say, well, not no as much as I should have, but I, I, I learned to compartmentalize okay. it. So I would not think about work, at, I wouldn't think about the children when I got home, I think about my own children. Mm. But I wasn't out running. I wasn't exercising like I wasn't eating like I should. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't right. doing the things that I should have done. Uh, you know, I didn't go to the spa. I didn't go get massages like I should have. Honey, go do all of that. Go do all of that. And that's interesting because you know that sometimes women, especially these superwomen, yeah. upwardly mobile, I can do it all moms, which I think is the biggest fallacy and the biggest setup it's, for failure. It is. They glamorize the hustle culture, which I think for communities that are trying to make their way and make their make a stand and be present and be at the upper echelons and profession, I think they get stuck in this hustle mentality that it has to be work work well, all now 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 I have to do it all now and sacrifice so that later things can be better versus no 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 the hustle culture cannot be glamorized we yeah. cannot do that especially as women especially for yeah. rearing children yeah. even if you're a man whatever it is you need to unplug and you need to be still and rest and right. sleep and eat healthy build your temple which is your body right. meditate meditate all journal of that. journal all Talk to your community. Lean on your group. Yeah. Go out with your friends. Go out with you. Laugh. Laugh. At yourself. Dance. Dance. And we love dancing. Yes, we do love dancing. Sure we do. do. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Okay. And for everybody on the outside, it looked like I had it all under control. Oh, I bet it did. It looked like, oh my God, she is, I mean, she's got this amazing career. She's got these great kids. You know, she's married. She's this. She's this. She's this. Wow. The first of the first of the first. First of the first of the first of the first of the first. Meanwhile, your she's health. A, yeah. She's on the cover of Black Enterprise. She's oh. she's the, named the top 100 women in corporate America and the magazines. I'm in this. I'm in that. I'm on 
um, the news. I'm on national news. I'm on uh, Neil Lair. I'm I'm on the front page of the Washington Post. But you're eating crackers and a Coca Cola. Yeah, to get through. Right. But it. But nobody knew that. At, on the outside, it was like. Of course. You know. And then I'd always try to be fabulous. Of course. You know, I have to be like. Yeah, I know. You know. And I never wore my robe clothes. I'd always wear fabulous stuff underneath. <sighs> Because I didn't want to sit there in a black robe, so I would I would dress to the nines oh. every day, as opposed to just going to work and pulling up the black robe. Because you could get by with that. Nobody sure. would know. No, Can no. we talk about that quickly? Yes. Because I do love also being bedazzled, as yeah. you can see. Yeah. Right. Presentations, everything is what I say. Everything. Why did you do that? Because you didn't have to. Because nobody would take you serious if you show up, maybe with your robe open and yeah. a beautiful blouse. Especially since there never been a black. That's person. what I'm saying. Chief Judge. That's what I'm saying. And I had to say, you know what? I'm doing it for me. I can't sit here every day in a black robe with the Judge Judy lace collar type mm -hmm. thing that you see on Judge Yeah. Judy. I couldn't do it. No. So I would come in. I got a lot of criticism. I didn't care. Yes. I didn't care. Right? I'd come in in my heel. I, you know, I can, you can come through the back. Nobody sees your feet. I come in in my heels. You it's, know, I know it. I make sure. And it didn't matter. Wow. Because it was for me. That's it. I needed to feel. I needed to feel really like I was on top of the world because my work was so hard every day. Mm. And that was my little thing. And so I translated that to TV. I started doing that. Of course, now the people, you know, mimicking me. But sure. everybody's like, well, Judge, we don't know about you. I said, listen, I did it in my real court, and I'm going to do it here. Good. So that's why I wear the big necklaces and the, you I know. I love watching you. All of that. I do all of that. I know. Because that's what I did in my own courtroom. Right. But I've seen you in real life, and that yeah. is how you are. That yeah. That's you. That's, that's authentic. Right? And so, so they can't handle it too bad. Too bad. Too bad. Too bad. And so I go, oh, you know, I sat on three fortune actually 500 actually 200 boards right three of them and so you know of course there's never been a black woman and i'm like oh my god here she comes and uh but all my board members all the execs and every company they were just so wonderful oh, to me okay. i would sit there and i'm like i'm gonna wear my hot pink yes. suit in here today i can't stand a power suit it's so the bad. stuffy ones Blech. it's so bad there were there was a hispanic woman oh. and a uh, another woman on the board and they just, an uh, 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 Asian American woman, uh, and we, the three of us became really good buddies. And they said, okay, uh -oh. we're not gonna wear blue and black to the next board meeting because you came in here with this orange suit on. Yes. And so one time, you know, one of them had on green, one of them had on red, one of them, I, you know, I mean, oh, had on purple. Just feel and better. And we'd all sit there and go. Yes. And they said, Glenda, thank you for teaching Isn't us this. Isn't it something? You know? I love a good they red said, lip and hoops. Yeah, they said, you, 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 yes. you, you made us come out. Yes. And especially the love. woman who was Hispanic. She said, girl, you know, that was really my nature anyway. <laughs> But it goes back to being your authentic self. You gotta be because how can self. you perform at the highest levels if you're trying to fit into these puzzle pieces because and, that's what you're supposed to look I, like? I did that at the beginning oh. of my career. You know, I only wore black suits and blue suits. That's what you're supposed to, supposed do. to do. That. You know, my mother said, she said, this is ridiculous. She said, Gwena, I'm tired of seeing it. So then she went on a business trip with me and she unpacked why I went downstairs. She said, girl, the suitcase looks like Easter eggs. <laughs> Good. That is a compliment. Yeah, it was a compliment. And so I said, Mom, you're so right. She said, just do you. Just do it. Yeah. Okay. I wish you'd know my mom. Oh, I wish. Her. Well, you're a shining example of everything she's taught you. And so, you know, I know her through you. Yes. And I know we could talk forever. And I'm going to have I you feel, back. I because feel like I've taken up so much time No, today. we've barely, like, scratched the surface <laughs> of it. So you can share so much more so you're coming back i would love to i've just back. decided well I, I knew that yes you know i would anything you ask me to do you know if i can I, do it it's I done it's done I it's done it. it's I not even you. a question thank you, thank you. but and i'm so proud of you oh thank you i'm so proud of you thank you i am thank you well it's my responsibility so it's your responsibility and I'm, I'm honored to do it yes so um you know the judge for those of you, you who you know her from tv you know a little bit more about her now but her family the family she comes from is it's a legacy family, you know, and she talks about the wealth that she grew up with wasn't monetary, but the wealth you grew up with has been generational because I now sure. we know your son, Charles, and we yes. know them through the rallies, Nick yes. and Courtney, That's right. who send their love. Thank also, you. Also um, amazing advocates for civil rights oh along goodness. with your son, but it's in your blood and 
the wealth of advocacy and yeah. and living your life for others at the service of others yeah. it's in your blood and so it's really an honor again you know I, you. I joke that we're girlfriends but we are girlfriends and family yes, we are but to that you are here to do this okay. and to be an example not only for the people listening and watching but the community Thank like you, we're Gina. watching you we watch you we use you i use you as an example thank you that and means so, a lot to me and you must know it and i just love you and thank i just you. can't wait to see what else you do thank next. you thank you thank you for thank being you. here thank you it's my pleasure yeah. and my responsibility yes <laughs>